Hello, my name is Cliff Freilich. I'm the executive director of Cinema St. Louis, and I'm joined by the co-directors of Wild Bill in Search of Fool's Gold, which is the documentary short that played with the Ballad of John Henry. Um, uh, the two co-directors are uh, Nate Carroll and Don uh, Leggins. Uh, Don Leggins, I uh, stumbled over that, I'm sorry. Uh, so anyway, let's start off with a simple question. Uh, I know you had both worked, and I want to get a little more background on uh, how you guys met and came to be collaborators on film, because it's an unusual story. But I, I wanted to uh, first ask, you had made narrative films up till now, narrative shorts, and you transist it now into making uh, uh, your first documentary. I was curious as to you know, why you wanted to tell this particular story and why you wanted to tell it in a documentary form as opposed to try and do some sort of fictional version of the Wild Bill Hickok story. Uh, for myself, it was a very interesting story. Um, the character of Wild Bill is really filled with duplicity. Um, on one hand, you have a gentleman who despises bullying, uh, an abolitionist, lawman, who at the same time had no issues taking a, uh, in part of the genocide of you know Native American culture, as well as uh, being involved in a lot of illicit activities, you know, gambler, womanizer. Um, so from that perspective, it was a very interesting story, uh, one that I latched on primarily uh, after reading Tom Clavin's book, um, a documentary on Wild Bill. And then through further research that Don and I both did, what really came out of it was no one really knows all the truth about Wild Bill. And um, he was really a marketing genius to himself. Uh, to quote Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut, you know, you need to be careful what you uh, pretend to be because in the end, that's what you become. And that's really kind of what happened to Wild Bill. He portrayed himself as a gunfighter, a uh, notorious gunfighter, a killer. And essentially, uh, in the end of his life, he was assassinated um, probably at his weakest moment. Uh, from a documentary perspective, uh, it started off as a project uh, for Lights Film School, an online film school that I was taking. And what started off as supposed to be just an eight-minute um, documentary piece really kind of uh, just started to grow as we traveled across the U.S. Um, filming the, uh, these locations, as well as doing more and more research. Uh, it was very exciting uh, to do a documentary, um, but you know how they say with filmmaking, you know, never make a, a film longer than 12 minutes and try to avoid period pieces, keep your actors and locations small. That, that didn't really work out for us, but um, I think we're better off for it. It was a fantastic story and we had a lot of fun making it. Uh, it sounds like Nate was sort of the primary motive force behind uh, choosing the subject, uh, uh, Don. Did you embrace it immediately? Did you have a previous interest in Wild Bill or was this something relatively new to you? Um, I enjoy history and I was intrigued uh, by the local history that it, it brought and um, how much history was in our backyard with it. Like we got to, to do a lot of traveling local um, through Illinois, Missouri, and, and see some uh, sites that you would normally overlook. Uh, and I, I found a lot of interest in that aspect of it. Okay. Um, we'll get a little bit more into the film itself, but I uh, first wanted to talk, uh, I believe, uh, from what I read on your website and elsewhere, uh, that you two met when you were both in the service. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, Don and I... Uh, both served in Afghanistan together in 2007, 2008. And so uh, even though, you, were you both from St. Louis and you met in Afghanistan? Had you had any previous interaction or? Uh... Well, well, since we were both Don was the... my boss, I'll let him cover that one. <laughs> <laughs> we were both in uh, the Illinois Guard at the time um, at opposite ends of the state and uh, I got pulled to go with a unit um, out of Chicago and our first meeting I guess was probably at Fort Bragg um, and uh, from there we we built our relationship uh, came close on deployment you know we grew close to, to those you have things in common with so did you both have an interest in filmmaking before you met in Afghanistan? I mean, was this, or actually in Fort Bragg, obviously, but uh, was this something that brought you together because you both were film fans? 
I would say uh, while there it was when uh, the just crazy ideas came out. We were we were talking, relaxing one evening, and started mulling over movies that we liked, and it kind of evolved into to making movies uh, thereafter. Yeah, we uh, we started with. I'd say in 2009, we kept throwing, or 2008, 2009, we kept throwing around script ideas uh, for like a TV series or a webisode. I think it took us maybe a decade, well, a little bit less than a decade to finally get off our butts and said, if we want to make uh, anything, we probably need to learn and do it ourselves. And that's, that's essentially how we started off uh, in 2018 when we really kind of picked up, picked up our first cameras. Uh, we did two micro shorts. Um, and then uh, that was followed the year, ne uh, the next year, uh, 2019, with the small claymations uh, stop motion film, which is still going through the festivals right now. And then in the interim, I was doing the film school, and we decided to uh, take on this documentary. It's a pretty wildly diverse filmography that you've already built. Uh, you have a science fiction film, a horror film, one that's in, uh, you know, an animated film that uh, apparently I know it's played at several Christian festivals, uh, more family, I guess, in orientation, and then now a documentary. Um, is there, uh, do you have a plan in place? Is, is this purposeful that you want to work in as many different uh, areas as possible just to sort of build your resume and also uh, make certain you can do just about anything? Well, you know, for, at least from my perspective, I'll let Don, Don chime in. Uh, they say that, you know, you have what, eight bad movies in you. So it's about time to just get them, you know, right out the way right now. Um, but uh, ultimately, you know, each one of those genres kind of have their own unique uh, style and theme. And it's really just kind of an exploration um, I, at least from myself, you know, I, I love horror films, uh, but, you know, doing things like comedy would be, you know, would be exciting as well. Uh, but we've always tried to take subject matter that was at least, um, didn't require a lot of crew. Uh, it could be a fairly self-contained story, um, or at least uh, with regards to the voice, uh, or excuse me, the claymation film, we could leverage voiceover actors. And that kind of bled into this film as well. Um, for the narrative, uh, as well as, you know, the character actors. Yeah, I agree. It's a, it, it was, uh, you know, finding what we like, because um, just picking it up and, and going with it, we, we learn things that we like, we don't like, and what worked, what didn't work, and um, through collaboration, learning other things that would be fun to try or interesting to try in, in the next film and how we can apply it, and doing things with a small staff, um, how we can be creative in uh, how we're doing the movies and, and making it work. Now, this was your first uh, venture into documentary territory. Is this something that you hope to do again in the future? Uh, was it a hard transition uh, or a relatively seamless one from narrative filmmaking? I'd say from at least a filmmaking perspective, um, it, you know, the run and gun perspective really wasn't much different from what we've done earlier because it's always, I mean, we've been making micro short films. Um, I would say the editing uh, was definitely one of the biggest challenges. Um, the travel, obviously, in coordinations. Uh, and at least from my perspective, the, mo the worst, or I shouldn't say the worst, but the most difficult portion was really just rights management with all the different historical societies, museums, um, the stock footage, uh, as well as working with the voiceover actors to secure the proper permissions. Okay, well, and all that actually is good prep uh, work as far as the working with the actors for uh, narrative filmmaking. And because it's an historical documentary in which you were doing recreations, it actually obviously has a lot of overlap with, uh, with narrative filmmaking too. You probably work from a script as opposed to uh, shooting and then seeing what you have as many documentarians do. Yeah, we had a bit of both. Um... When we first started shooting the reenactment troupe, there was 37 uh, reenactment actors, uh, period costumes, uh, partaking in the uh, Wild Bill uh, Days Festival up in LaSalle, Illinois. And prior to even having a script um, that was still being worked out through the film school collaboration with Don, um, it was just a matter of we have about 30 days to get up there and start filming. So um, it was working with them, securing the permissions, shooting, and then trying to fit that all in the, um, in the editing room. 
Uh, but it was still a great opportunity because, I mean, without that, I mean, it adds so much uh, charm and authenticity to the film. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Wild Bill Hickok? Did you uh, emerge from this as uh, an admirer? Or, you know, you mentioned that he's a complex figure with a lot of uh, uh, bad and good uh, that, uh, that contribute. What, what are your sort of bottom line thoughts after having lived with him for uh, this amount of time? You know, from my perspective, it comes down to, I don't think anybody truly knew Wild Bill, and we probably never will. Um, the evidence, you know, you talk, I've talked to you know, historians, Don and I both talked to historians across the United States. Everyone has different stories. So much of it is built on folklore. Mm -hmm. um, I find it interesting from, uh, you know, a belief perspective. You know, he was raised an abolitionist, partook in um, uh, helping uh, the slaves escape through the Underground Railroad, shoveling them across the Illinois River so they can move on to Canada. Um, but once again, when you start talking about uh, some of the activities that occurred in the West um, with the Native Americans, the conflicts out there, uh, he definitely had his own opinion or at least exaggerated his own opinions and his dislike uh, for the Native American population, uh, essentially to elevate his uh, notoriety in the media, at which time, of course, was, you know, telegram uh, in dime novels. So um, if historians, especially those that have, uh, you know, greater background and more breadth of knowledge, uh, still don't know a wild bill, I don't think anyone will. Uh, I hope this documentary at least kind of highlights, uh, highlights some of his accomplishments as well as shows people what things were really like back then um, in hopes that we don't make the same mistakes. And Don, did you want to add anything there? Well, I, I agree. I mean, it, it's hard to separate the myth from the man. Um, the myth is, is quite interesting that uh, to say, you know, the man, it, it's impossible the way the, the history has been written. Okay, well, great. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to, to join us. Uh, Co-directors Don Leggins, uh, Nate Carroll, a wild bill. Uh, we look forward to seeing more of your work in the future. Thank you. Thank you.